Good morning. morning. Like many of you, this uh, situation in the panhandle has been on my heart this week. And I was thinking about, uh, we've got a number of folks who who participate with us online who are in the panhandle, who are right in the middle of all of this. And so it's those that are with us right now, uh, worshiping, that are uh, really affected by this. And it's it's clear, you know, I, I They've heard some comments today, but it's clear in this room that there's a great deal of love, a lot of prayers, and a lot of willingness to help uh, for our neighbors uh, right down the road. All right, we're going to continue looking at uh, the Gospel of John. We're looking at lessons from the upper room. There's five chapters here that uh, take place, uh, a special teaching the night before Jesus' crucifixion. It's called the Farewell Discourse. And it reminded me of a story that's told about a preacher who was saying goodbye to a congregation. He just preached his last sermon with that church, and afterward, an elderly lady spoke with him, and and she said, the the next preacher won't be as good as you. And of course, he was a little flattered by that. And but it, you know, he said, no, I'm I'm sure the next guy will be be really great. And she said, no, really. I've been here for five ministers, and every one has been worse than the last one. <laughs> takes, takes a little while. Uh, in, in our text today, uh, Jesus is leaving. He's been with his disciples, and he's about to depart. He's not going to be with them the way he has been for so long. And he even says things like in chapter 16, it's to your advantage that I go away. And I have a feeling they had a hard time understanding how that could be the case. And as he explained how that's going to be the case, he talks about the one who's going to come after him, the Holy Spirit. And so uh, I, think, um, I think we need to hear that. I think we need to hear what Jesus says about the one who comes after him. So we're going to listen today to what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, which turns out to be what the Holy Spirit says. John chapter 14, we're going to pick up in verse 15 uh, and read through the end of the chapter. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see, see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father." Rise, let us go from here. Now, I remember being a kid, and after church services, at some point, my parents would say, all right, kids, let's go. And so we'd go get in the car, and 30 minutes later, 
we would leave. Uh, you've probably had that experience. You, you might notice there at the end of this, it says, rise, let us, let us go from here. Uh, it seems to indicate that they get up and leave the upper room at this point. But what's interesting is the teaching goes on, and it's actually in chapter 18 that it becomes more clear that they actually leave. And so it raises a lot of questions, and I guess we speculate a little bit. Maybe they were in the upper room longer than this. The teaching just went on. Maybe Jesus taught as they went on the road after this. We don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's the same teaching. And the point is, is that John wants us to linger here. He doesn't want us to rush through this night with Jesus. This is such a special moment. And he wants us to linger and hear everything that's here. Now, I want to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit that comes out in this text. I am not going to try to cover everything that we just read. There is a lot there. Uh, I want to focus on what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. That's the main thing that's in focus. That's what he's reassuring his disciples with, is the coming of the Spirit. And I'm going to bring to bear on it some of the insights that are in chapter 15 and 16, because in all three of these chapters, Jesus stresses and talks about, teaches about the Holy Spirit. Now, he uses a particular word four times in the farewell discourse to refer to the Holy Spirit. It was twice in this passage, four times in the whole discourse, he uses this same word for the Holy Spirit. We see it in verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Okay, helper. Uh, the word that's used here, let's just kind of think about the meaning of this word. The definition is real simple, simple, one who is called to the side of another to help. Okay, so helper makes sense, right? It's somebody that's called to be alongside you to help you. Uh, there's various translations. Uh, the King James Version uses the word comforter. CSB says counselor. None of those are wrong. Okay? The diversity of, of words that are used are not wrong. They're all communicating things that the Holy Spirit does. Um, but I think the best word is advocate. Advocate, I think, is the closest English equivalent to the word that Jesus used for the Holy Spirit. Um, here, here's why. The primary usage of the time was legal. It was a, a legal usage. A person who pleads the cause of another in court. That's primarily the way that that word, it's translated helper, was used. So advocate. Uh, if you read on in chapter 15 and 16, you'll see that Jesus, when he's talking about the Holy Spirit, he uses legal language. In chapter 15, verse 26, he'll talk about the Spirit bearing witness about Jesus. In chapter 16, verse 7, convicting the world of sin and righteousness. In other words, the Holy Spirit is an advocate for Jesus and his cause. So he's using that word advocate, talking about the Holy Spirit, the way we might think of a legal advocate. In chapter 14, which we just read, the word is used twice. And in this case, it's, it's advocacy for Jesus' followers. To be an advocate of Jesus and his cause is to be an advocate for Jesus' followers. So he's assuring them, you will have one who is with you forever. I'm not going to leave you orphaned. Uh, that's the way that a disciple would think if a rabbi left them and they've got no rabbi, they're, they're orphaned. I'm not going to leave you that way. You're going to have one who is with you, who is your advocate. Now, the reason I like um, the word advocate uh, is because it captures this legal sense, but, but also because it, it makes, makes us understand that this helper is not just an emotional support. Okay? You, if you hire an attorney, you don't... You don't hire somebody who's going to come in and say, I got your back, you go on, you know, I'm here for you. No, you've got one that leads the way, who represents you, who, who speaks for you. You have somebody that you can depend on. So I think the advocate kind of captures the stronger sense of what the Holy Spirit is doing for us. Now, advocate, though, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on any lawyer jokes, okay, because we have some lawyers in here. Some of them are elders. 
Um, but we, we probably don't always think of lawyers or attorneys in a warm sense, okay? We don't think affection, closeness, that kind of thing. And, and this is why sometimes we avoid the word advocate, because it doesn't capture the way they would have originally grasped it. In practice, an advocate was usually a friend or a family member rather than a professional hire. It was usually somebody you knew, who loved you, that said, I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm going to plead your, your cause. I'm going to be in this for you and with you. Uh, so it's, it's, it's warm. So you might think about it, if you're ever in a hospital, you know you need an advocate, right? You need a friend or a family member with you who knows, you know, your, a nurse may come in, how are you? And you say, I'm fine. And then they leave the room and, and that advocate says, no, you are not. I'm going to go tell them. You got to deal with this, okay? So it's somebody who knows you intimately and who's not going to leave you without help. So it's, it's a powerful picture. Now, I want to also notice this advocate is not something but someone. You notice it's translated he rather than it. Okay? And I think it's just it's easy for us to accidentally say that. There's no judgment there. Sometimes we talk about the Holy Spirit, we say it. Uh, that's, that's not meant to be offensive, but the Holy Spirit is He. Uh, it, it, the reason that we use that language, that we translate it that way, is because everywhere the Holy Spirit is talked about, He has the attributes of personhood. Uh, this is a someone. And this someone is distinct from the Son, but at the same time inseparable from Him. Notice the way that Jesus talked about him, another helper or another advocate. Uh, it's uh, this when, was communicating a couple of things. Uh, one, this is somebody distinct from Jesus. Uh, Jesus is also an advocate. The Holy Spirit is another advocate. There's a distinction there. Advocate is actually applied to Jesus as well. The only other the only other place that advocate shows up in the New Testament was actually read at communion today, and it's Jesus, the one who speaks in our defense. He's an advocate. Jesus is our advocate, and the Spirit is also another advocate, distinct from the Son, but inseparable from Him. Look at the language there. He's called the Spirit of Truth. If you'll back up just a few verses, I know it was last week when we talked about it, but what did Jesus say about Himself? I am the way and the truth, and the life. And now we have the spirit of truth. He is another, but he is inseparable from him. Uh, he goes on to say, you know him. This is not an unfamiliar advocate. You already know him, for he dwells with you. This is, uh, John has already talked about this at the beginning of the gospel, that uh, the, the word has tabernacled among us. The one who is in the, the one who is with them in Jesus is the same one who's with them with the Spirit. You know him. He's a distinct, a distinct person, but inseparable from him. So we could uh, put it this way. The Holy Spirit is the personal presence of God with us and for us always. The personal presence of God. You cannot separate the Spirit, from the Son and the Father. And that will become even more clear as, as we continue on. Now, this is a promise for all who are baptized into Christ that the Spirit will be with you. When you're baptized, you're forgiven of your sins and you're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the personal presence of God to be with you and for you, your advocate. This is not an impersonal force with you. This is God with you, the person of the Spirit with you, inseparable from Father and Son. And it gives you great uh, courage and confidence that whatever you face in life, you don't face alone. You face it with the powerful help and comfort and guidance of the Holy Spirit who pleads your cause, your advocate. You have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who speaks for you in your defense. You have an advocate with you, distinct from the Son, but inseparable from Him, who is with you. An advocate in heaven, an advocate with you. It's a powerful, 
picture. Uh, Paul in, in Romans writes a lot about uh, the Spirit. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Intercession and advocacy are closely related. The Spirit intercedes for you with groanings too deep for words. Last week, we talked about how important our prayers are to God, how he wants us to ask and to ask big. And here, he's under what we're reminded of in the Spirit's advocacy is the one we have with us who asks on our behalf. It does not all depend on our praying. Our prayer matters, but it doesn't all depend on our praying. We have the Holy Spirit with us who intercedes for us. I find a great deal of comfort and encouragement in that. So we see the Spirit as an advocate. We also see the Spirit as homemaker. Now, I'm grateful to uh, Sinclair Ferguson for that, uh, for that description, homemaker. I would not have thought about that. It's not a very theological-sounding word, but it's, it's the right word. It's the word that states perfectly the role of the Spirit that comes into focus in verses 22 and following. So let's skip now to chapter 14, verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot. I love how John gives that. Uh, little, just make sure you know who we're talking about here, not, uh, not the betrayer. Judas said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So right before this, Jesus has been saying, I'm leaving, but you will see me again. And if you'll read that closely, it seems that he's talking about resurrection appearances, that I'm, I'm leaving, but you're going to see me again embodied in the resurrection. But he seems to be indicating something more, something deeper, something beyond resurrection appearance. And so Judas is asking him, in what way are, are you going to be manifest to us, but not to uh, the whole world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words and the words that you hear. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Okay, so he makes a distinction between those who love and obey him and those who don't. And among those who love and obey him, he talks about that we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, I believe this is what's, what we would call the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In those verses, the Spirit is not explicitly mentioned. But in the context, that's what's being discussed, the coming of the Spirit. That's the whole topic that's going on, the coming of the Spirit. In verse 17, Jesus even said, he will be in you. You already know him. He dwells with you. You've known him because you've known me, but now he will dwell in you. Uh, Romans 8, again, really underlines that. We'll say the Spirit dwells in you. The Spirit comes in to indwell us. I love the word that's used in here, the word uh, home. Notice it there. The word home is the same word that was used earlier in our text from last week for rooms or dwelling places. Remember that? Jesus goes to prepare a place. He said, in my father's house, there are many rooms. It's the same word that's used here for home. So you might think about it this way. We have a homemaker, Jesus, who has gone to the Father for us to prepare a place. We have a homemaker, the Spirit, who has come to us from the Father. We have an advocate in heaven. We have an advocate with us. We have a homemaker in heaven. We have a homemaker with us, within us. We have a future home with God. We have God at home with us now. I just think that's amazing uh, and so encouraging. Notice also the, the plural language used in there. We will come to him and make our home with him. There, there again, we see in the coming of the Spirit, in the indwelling of the Spirit, that is a distinct person but inseparable from Father and Son. 
Father and Son are inseparable from the Spirit's indwelling of a believer. Uh, I really appreciate the way that uh, scholar Andrew Lincoln puts this. The Spirit is the mediator of the presence of Jesus and the Father to believers. To have the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit is with you, the Father and Son are with you. You cannot separate the Spirit from the Father and the Son. So if the Spirit indwells us, Jesus says, the Father and I are making our home with you. That's why we will talk about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, Christ in us, Christ dwelling in our hearts. The reason we can use that language is because we have the Spirit. When the Spirit indwells us, we can say at the same time, Christ is in us. He dwells in our hearts. So we have the indwelling of the Spirit, but we also have uh, the Holy Spirit's transforming work. I think just reflecting and meditating on this text leads to uh, further reflection beyond the indwelling, what we would call home-making, transforming work. Uh, Notice the language in there. We will come to him and make our home with him. Make our home. That's active. It's doing. It's accomplishing something. Uh, If any of you have ever uh, had to write on a form that says, what is your occupation, and you write homemaker, that does not mean I don't have an occupation, right? That does not mean I don't do work. It's describing what your work is. You, you make home home. You work for the family, for the good of the family, for that home. It's, a, it's, it's good work. It's important work. The Spirit is not just with us. The Spirit is working, home making. The Spirit is making us a fitting dwelling for God. We'd use the language of sanctifying making us holy, transforming us so that our lives reflect the holiness and the love of God. The Spirit is making us a fitting dwelling for God. Other places where we see this, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll talk about from the Spirit comes transformation into Christ's likeness. That's the Spirit's work in our life. He's not just with us and we find comfort in that. It's not just emotional support. It's transformational power to reshape our lives into the image of Christ. Galatians 5 will talk about the desires of the Spirit, that we're to be led by what the Spirit wants, not what we want. And as we are led by the desires of the Spirit, in our life will be produced the fruit of the Spirit. So the Spirit has this transforming, sanctifying role in our life, making us a dwelling fit for God. Uh, We put it this way, the Holy Spirit dwells in believers and makes us into holy dwellings. The Holy Spirit is not just a guest. The Holy Spirit takes up residence, moves in permanently. Jesus said to be with you forever. And he comes not just to be with us, but to make our hearts home for the living God. To make our lives a house fit for God. Uh, our, our young folks with LTC, are, I've been hearing them learn this song, uh, Sanctuary. Uh, sanctuary just means a, a holy place. And, and what the prayer is in the song is, O oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be a holy place, a holy dwelling, because God, Father, Son, and Spirit is making His home in me. This is the lifelong work of the Holy Spirit in our life, to make us a holy dwelling. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. It's reminding us, God has moved in. He dwells within you. And the Spirit's desire is to make you a holy person. Listen. Be led by the Spirit. Let your life conform, be transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit 
in you. Okay, third role or ministry of the Holy Spirit that we see in this passage is that of teacher. This role is a major role that Jesus emphasizes of the Holy Spirit uh, in chapter 14, but also in chapter 16. Uh, before, I, before I lose you, I want to say that this is one of those places where we get really, just a lot of misunderstanding. So we got to be really careful how we hear what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit as a teacher. Let's look at chapter 14, verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Okay, now here's where we've got to be careful. We have to remember who he's talking to. He's talking to the eleven. He's talking to his apostles. And he's saying the Holy Spirit is going to help you preserve the teaching that I've given you and, and going to explain the teaching. You're going to come to a better understanding and remembrance of what I've taught you because of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what we see in the New Testament. We see the recall that the Holy Spirit gave to those apostles of all that Jesus taught them and a greater grasp of their understanding. It's why we have these five chapters that unfold the heart of Christ. The Holy Spirit is guiding John to remember that conversation and to grasp the meaning of it so that we can really get what's happening. How many times in Scripture do we see the disciples not getting it? How many times do they not grasp what's going on? Jesus even said in chapter 13, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Because the Holy Spirit is going to come and make clear to you what all of this means. So as we read our New Testament, especially as we get Acts through Revelation, what we're seeing is the apostles unfolding the meaning of the teaching, the life, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is not something they made up. That is what Jesus said the Holy Spirit is going to remind you and teach you in. Now, not only uh, is the Holy Spirit preserving and explaining the teaching of Christ, uh, he's also completing the teaching of Christ. Again, remember, we're talking to the 11, not, not to us. Uh, the, uh, the apostles had a brief time with Jesus. They didn't even get a four-year education with Jesus. And he has said in verse 30 of our text, I will no longer talk much with you, but there's still more to come. So we're going to jump over to John chapter 16, verse 12, talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, this is still upper room conversation, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Spirit is going to guide you into all truth. He's going to remind you of what I've taught you. He's going to teach you, help you understand what it means, and he's going to continue your education in those things that you cannot bear now. The Spirit is going to do that. He's even going to declare things to come. Further revelation. And the result of that is what we call the New Testament. This is where we have to be careful because we're not saying the Holy Spirit is going to give you and I a new revelation. He is saying the Holy Spirit is going to give to you, apostles, everything you need will guide you into all truth. And that the result of that is that we have this trustworthy apostolic teaching in the New Testament that is the result of the Holy Spirit. So let's put it this way. The Holy Spirit inspired New Testament writers and illuminates our reading of it. Okay, uh, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit that we read about in John 14 and 16 was for the apostles. To read the apostles' teaching, to read the New Testament, is to read God-breathed words. 
It's to read words that have come about because of the teaching of the Holy Spirit, reminding, teaching, and completing the teaching of Jesus. What you have when you open up your New Testament are God-breathed words, Holy Spirit-given words. And there's all kinds of things that speak to the reliability of that, the manuscript evidence, historical and geographical accuracy that we read in that, but also just this divine quality about it. There is not another book like what you have in your hands. There is something about that that speaks of a divine author. Uh, Michael Kruger is a scholar, uh, works in canon formation, and I was reading a book that he actually wrote for college age. Uh, when his daughter went to college, he wrote a book that was for college age uh, folks as they go off to the university. And he writes about this divine quality that you read in the scriptures. And he talks about the whole Bible, not, not just the New Testament, the whole Bible, written by, think about this, 40 plus authors in various locations around the world, in very diverse cultures, speaking different languages, and yet all joining together to tell the same overarching story of redemption in Jesus. There's a, there's a unity and a cohesiveness to the scriptures that you just can't explain, he says, naturalistically. You can't get four people to write something like that, much less 40. And, and across different languages and times and places, this cohesive narrative about Jesus. Uh, it, it speaks of divine authorship. So read your scriptures. Uh, you young folks, that New Testament, the, those, nobody made that up. That is God-breathed, inspired scripture. Read it. Now, the, the Holy Spirit is not giving us new revelation, but the Holy Spirit is a part of our reading. The word that we use for this is Illumination. It just means turning the light on. It's like the Holy Spirit turns the light on for us. One place where we see this, Ephesians 1, 17 through 18. Paul prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So there, there is this Holy Spirit who is with you, has a role in enlightening the eyes of your heart and helping you to see and grasp and understand, not to give you some new insight that nobody else has about the scriptures, but to really hear the voice of your God and your maker, to grasp it, to get it into your soul, and the Holy Spirit uses that to change and transform your life. So it's a, it's a real simple takeaway. Read those Holy Spirit-inspired words. Don't read them like any other book. Read them as God's word to you. I love this prayer. I don't know who to attribute it to. I've read it in multiple places. Lord, open your word to us and open us to your word. Okay? I want to be receptive to Holy Spirit-inspired words. I want to be open to that. But I, I need... I need you to open the word to me. I need it to be unfolded for me so that I can grasp it. Now, in conclusion, I want to quote what Jesus says in John 16, 14 of the Spirit. He says, he will glorify me. Um, a lot of times when we talk about the Holy Spirit, or you'll hear, you'll hear people make this, this comment, uh, the Holy Spirit's neglected. We don't talk about the Holy Spirit enough. And, and there's a, a degree to which I agree with that. I think we do need to teach more on the Holy Spirit. We need to talk more about the Holy Spirit. And we shouldn't neglect the Holy Spirit. Jesus doesn't. But at the same time, the very role of the Spirit is to direct us to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Wherever the Holy Spirit is and is working, we're going to have our eyes opened to the glory and the beauty and the grace of Jesus. So sometimes the Holy Spirit is very much involved, and yet that's not who we're talking about. 
Because we're, we're looking at Jesus, and the reason for that is because we need to see what Jesus has done for us. You need to see what Jesus has done for you. And the Holy Spirit works to point you there. Uh, J.I. Packer has a great illustration of a floodlight. He talks about when in landscaping, when you put up a floodlight, nobody walks around going, oh, wow, what a great light. They see what the light illuminates. And he said the role of the Holy Spirit is very much like that. He illuminates Christ so that the more the Holy Spirit is working and acting in our life, the more we are seeing what wonder and grace and power there is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see him? Do you see the beauty of the heart of Jesus? Do you see what he's done for you? Is it illuminated for you today? We don't just tag this ending on the end of a sermon, you know, the, the invitation, Christ died for your sins, life is found in him alone, put your faith in him, follow him. That's not a tag on on the end of the sermon. That is where the Holy Spirit points us over and over and over again is to see what Christ has done for you. That is salvation for you. That is where life is for you, and you won't find it anywhere else. So if you are not a believer in Jesus today, well, if you, if you do believe, but you have not expressed that faith and, put, uh, and, and been baptized into him, let's do it. And the promise is you'll be forgiven of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If we can help you with that, I invite you to come to the front while we stand and sing.